Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? You know that recurring scene in The Simpsons of Bart and Lisa in the backseat of Homer's pink Plymouth Junkerola, where they keep asking over and over again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I feel like that pretty much sums up my experience of the last four years. This has been the most exhausting four years of politics that I've ever experienced. And as much as I cannot wait for it to be over, I'm genuinely concerned about the possibility that there's not going to be a clear winner and that this thing is going to drag out all the way to the inauguration. No matter what happens tomorrow, many people aren't going to be okay with it. But the idea that we may not have a clear winner or that Democrats or Republicans may not accept the outcome of this election is really uncharted territory. So rather than bring on a guest to speculate about what's going to happen this week, I figured I'd give us both a break and use the opportunity to share an interview that I recently did on the Epicenter podcast, which is one of the older crypto podcasts around and one of the first that I ever really listened to because the hosts were always so knowledgeable and genuinely geeky in a way that I found both endearing but also educational. So I was excited to be invited on. Plus, whenever someone goes on Epicenter, they make this really cool pixelated image of you that I've always really wanted, so now I have it. What you're about to hear is the second half of our discussion, where I share my opinion on many of the subjects that we discuss on this show, but that I don't often have a chance to spend a lot of time opining on on my own podcast. You can learn more about Epicenter at epicenter.tv. Sebastian and Federica did a fantastic job, and it was a real pleasure for me to have a chance to speak with them. If you feel the same way, I suggest you let them know by writing them a review on Apple Podcasts. I keep asking all of you to write reviews of Hidden Forces every week, but this week, please take a moment to let the folks at Epicenter know how you feel about the work that they do. So, without any further ado, please enjoy this rare opportunity to hear the mic turned around in the other direction by hosts Sebastian Couture and Frederica Ernst. We've had this conversation over email. I would love you for you to, uh, you know, talk about how you, well, I mean, how you how you perceive the economy to be like this kind of Ponzi uh, system, as you describe it, and then how that relates to uh, some of the exuberance we see in, in uh, crypto. Well, I don't even know where to begin on this one. Well, let's maybe start with the current economic context and the financial crisis we find ourselves in. (laughs) I know. I think that there's been a gradual hollowing out of the American economy and an increased financialization of our economy. And on a very fundamental level, if you really understand what capital markets are and what function they serve, their job is to help allocate capital to the most efficient private sector actors who can use that capital to create productive capacity and grow the capital stock of the economy. And that is fundamentally what is supposed to be reflected in stock valuations. And of course, stock valuations always go through periods of booms and busts of overvaluation and undervaluation, but there's always been this sort of tenuous relationship to underlying reality. Even during the the new era of the 1920s, or the new age of the 1920s, or the new paradigm economy of the late 90s, the bull market story was very much focused on the future and was an exuberant interpretation of innovations that were going on in the economy. What's alarming and deeply disquieting in the same way that, not in the same way, but in raising some of the same feelings for me that the, that the debate raised is that 
the story today to justify participation in financial markets and to justify asset prices is actually not based on any irrational interpretation of the underlying economic data or where we're going to be going in the next few years. It's entirely based on this idea that markets are simply a political utility, that they are simply a place where public sector actors, primarily the, the Federal Reserve at this point, act in order to sustain prices. That they're just simply a, a feeding trough for people with 401ks and people with stock market portfolios. And that's so incredibly scary because the markets are, are fundamentally broken. They're no longer actually serving their purpose, which is to efficiently allocate capital in order to grow the economy. And without the economy growing, eventually, it's just like the desert of the real in the matrix. You could be in a matrix, everything could seem fine, but the outside world is charred and burned. So like we cannot live without the world. You know, We cannot live without resources and a real economy. And I just feel like what, what our authorities are doing is they are going, at this point, I don't know if they can really go back. I don't think they can actually. You know, They're just not. They're going to go for broke because they're fully invested at this point. And central banks are basically, they're handcuffed to the wheel. And they're just going to drive this thing right off the cliff. So yeah, that's my kind of short answer. I can elaborate if you want on different points. Happy to. Yeah. Can you maybe clear up for me? You said that basically the Fed or other central banks kind of caused this. So how would you say that they caused this? Is this just a matter of making capital super cheap or are there other things playing into it? Yeah. So I, I definitely don't mean to suggest that it's only central banks. But I think that central banks are marginal actors, and to the extent that they are marginal actors, they can have a really important impact on the economy and on markets. I think this is like really multifactorial. I mean, it, the best starting point for me is usually going back to the late 60s, early 70s, and eventually with the, the unpegging of, of the dollar to gold, and the financial deregulation that started in the late 70s through the 80s. And I think also, of course, the liberalization of trade and the adoption of the kind of neoliberal consensus as a, a working form of economic logic for how we, we conduct foreign policy and, and trade relations. And I think also technology has had a powerful deflationary force on the economy. And all of those factors, it's so interesting for me, and I don't know if this is because I was born in the early 80s and I was in high school in the late 90s, and I was in college in the early 2000s. And so this is like kind of, the, they say that those years are the years where you form, for example, your, your favorite tastes in music, that the songs you hear in your, when you're 19 or 20 are the songs you love for the rest of your life. And so maybe I'm ascribing too much value to the late 90s and the early 2000s. But I think that the 9-11 attacks from a political standpoint were, and generally were the, the most consequential events, the response to those events were the, were the most consequential for the path of American decline. And I think the late 90s, the way that in which Greenspan responded in the face of not only the exuberant markets, but also things like long-term capital management and the use of, and the tequila crisis and the use of the Federal Reserve to smoothen volatility in financial markets. I think, and Actually, to go back to the point I was making about deflation and trade, Greenspan relied on what he was seeing in prices, which were partly being influenced by the deflationary forces of trade and technology. He was relying on that data to make a, an assumption about the efficacy of raising rates in the face of low inflation. And so he continued to keep his foot on the accelerator. And I think that combined with the Fed response, which may have been justified to the 2001 terrorist attacks, then again, subsequently, the prolonged period of low interest rates and enormous balance sheet expansion post-2008, coupled, of course, with the malfeasance in our political system. I mean, anyone who saw people like Hank Paulson, and I don't want to name names because I don't want to make it personal because it's not really personal, but anyone who saw how our system operated in the, in the face of the 2008 crisis, 
I think, cannot seriously say that we don't have a deeply compromised political system. And people saw that. So the combination of the political malfeasance along with monetary policy in the face of the liberalization of trade and the deflation caused by technology, I think all of those things have led to a hollowing out of the real economy, an accelerated hollowing out. And I think a disenchantment by the public and a sense, I've talked about it in terms of market nihilism, but a general nihilism, a sort of whatever, it's all a scam, markets are a scam, the dollar's a fiat shit coin, just own the Ponzi, you know, love the bomb and just go with it. And I think that's kind of what's happened. And I think when I watch the Biden-Trump debate, I see Trump as like, an agent of chaos that is here to reap what we've sown. And that's what I saw in that debate. And I think that that many people in the country don't give a shit. And they understandably don't because they're so angry. And human beings, we're not rational automata. We're understandably emotionally motivated. And people are just angry and they want to see it burn. So I, I'm afraid that that's where we are. And I just worry about the international components of this because if we didn't have to worry about all of these frozen conflicts and all these tripwires in the international community and these countries like China and Russia, we could figure it out. But my concern is that we're in a really bad place. We're backpedaling and we're facing competitors who are very strong and very capable and they want to hurt us. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I definitely have similar sentiments, this nihilism that you describe it's something that I I personally feel like on a pretty regular basis. Like this, you know, when not to make this all about the debate, but like there's this almost it's almost like watching like a sporting event or like a boxing match or something. It's like this is like for entertainment value. And then that extends also to the entire shit show, which is like the rest of the world right now. It's like But the thing is I would say, Sebastian, and sorry to interrupt, but I do want to say this. I think that's true for how political debates have been for a long time. They've been these political contests and the and the television media has really profited from doing that. They've driven that. I think what was so scary about this debate was that Trump pierced the veil. And he pierced the veil from it being this WWE show contest to like the moment where the guy just broke his neck and he's stabbing him in the neck. You know, it, it no longer felt like it was controlled. It felt like we were really seeing the collapse of the pretense of political decorum and civilization right in front of us. And that's what I found so honestly terrifying. But see, to me, that, that kind of extends to, you know, the entire kind of political discourse right now, not only in the US, but also in every other country. I mean, being in Europe, we see it in we're starting to see it in France. Like, you know, last week there was talk of like Marseille seceding from France for fuck's sakes. You know what I'm saying? It's like all these insane notions that you know, five, ten years ago would have seemed absolutely insane. People are are saying out loud. I'd like to come back to the crisis and get your thoughts on, you know, like I think people who are not in the weeds of this thing will look at a financial crisis and look at another and just say, oh, it's just like another financial crisis, right? Like they're the same thing, just there was one that happened 12 years ago and like one's happening now. Like what's fundamentally different about this financial crisis and how institutions are dealing with it? And like, what are those ramifications for the future, like for the next you know, 10, 15 years, you think? <laughs> wow. So let me just comment on the point about the EU before I go to the to the question. I might have to have you re-ask it actually. But in terms of Europe, I think, yes, there's been a strong secession fever that we've actually seen going back to the early... There were, there were pockets of this going back to the early 2000s. I do think ironically with the retreat of, of American power and the damaging of US-EU relations, I think that Ironically, that could actually lead to further European unification and solidarity. So I think that the EU currently is one of those places where I actually feel somewhat bullish on unification. I actually think that they can hold it together so long as they have the right leaders because they can see the value of a unified Europe. That really does depend a lot on the French and the, and the Germans, as has always been the case. Could you just 
ask me again that that last question you had? No, the question is like, how different is the handling of this financial crisis compared to the 2008 crisis? And what are the consequences of that, like the fundamental difference of how that crisis is being handled by institutions? I mean, the 2008 crisis was... It was, a, it was a crisis not unlike crises that we've seen before, in that it was a banking crisis. It was a crisis caused by excessive amounts of credit. And I th- whereas I think that this crisis today is totally a political crisis. You know, I mean, in 2008, there wasn't an expectation that the Fed was going to do all the things that it's done. There was a deep fear that we were going to have an economic depression because that's what happened the last time this happened. I think that because of the Fed's reaction and the government's reaction in 2008, they basically took ownership of financial markets and capital markets. And so now, when markets look like they're going to decline, it becomes a political problem. And that's to the point about markets being a political utility. And I think that's a term that I, I stole from Ben Hunt. I don't know if I did, but in case I did. And so I think that what we're actually dealing with today is not a financial crisis. What we're dealing with today is a political crisis because markets are, what, they're like near an all time high, aren't they? I mean, I don't really check regularly, but we're near again or we overtook again all time highs. I mean, we had an insane rebound in the middle of a pandemic with elections coming up where you might get a Democratic candidate who's going to raise taxes, which you would expect would cause people to sell a bunch of their stocks so they could take some profits before taxes go up. And all the other uncertainty that comes with that, all the geopolitical uncertainties we've talked about. But because the Fed has been such an omnipotent force in the market, people's feelings about risk have had to take a back seat to the reality of Fed power. But the Fed's not really isn't omnipotent. So there comes a point at which our concerns that would make us want to sell financial assets overwhelm the Fed's capacity to one, sustain them, and two, sustain them in the face of a dollar that continues to hold its purchasing power. So it doesn't end well. And that's what I would say is the difference between where we are today and 2008. 2008, we could have really done something and our economy could have actually been stronger coming out of that, but not today. So you say it doesn't end well. Maybe let me kind of riff off of that. So to me, what's truly remarkable in this crisis is that it's actually several concurrent crises that are happening at the very same time. So basically, it's the corona epidemic, it's the incredible unemployment, it's the trade wars, it's the tangible effects of you know changing climate. So the US running out of letters to name the hurricanes after disturbing wildfires. And um, then it's the r- racial inequality and the class divide that kind of but this entire Black Lives Matter movement, and and rightly so. And I mean, basically, you can, it feels from the outside, the pictures that we see over here in Europe, it looks a lot like, you know, the start of a, you know, a civil war that's kind of incited by, by the president. So a couple of years ago, actually, in the primaries for the last presidential election, I read a book, Collapse by Jared Diamond. I'm sh- you know it, right? Yeah, so basically it's about societies and how they collapse and why people don't see it coming as societies are collapsing. So wh- why are people cutting down the very last tree if it's, you know, a fisheries-based economy and so on? And basically the point that Jared Diamond makes is that it's super difficult to actually see this while it is happening because it feels so normal because most aspects of our lives don't change during collapse, and it only becomes apparent afterwards. So this is my very long-winded way of asking. Do you think the U.S. and the world as we currently know it, with the U.S. as you know, the mightiest force, do you think we're in the mid to early stages of collapse? That's a very great question and a very difficult one to answer. I actually want to tell your listeners that I read an article a few days ago by someone named Indy Samaravija, I, I'm so sorry I messed up the name. She wrote the article for, I think, on Medium, and uh, the article is called, I Live Through Collapse, America is Already There. And I quoted part of the article and I tweeted it out, and this 
part, there are a lot of really quotable parts of the article, but this is the part that stuck out to me. And it relates directly to your question. America has already collapsed. What you're feeling is exactly how it is. It's Saturday and you're thinking about food while the world is on fire. This is normal. This is life during collapse. And that felt very, very much like what we're going through. You mean like there's this denial? Is that the, this sort of denial of what's going on around you? Not not so much denial, but what is it? I'm, I'm sure there's a term for it in biology or behavioral psychology where you adjust your sense of normalcy based on, you can very quickly, things become normal. And I think that's probably an adaptive condition because it's a lot easier to survive if you don't have to constantly feel like everything's abnormal. So I think that we just all just quickly become accustomed. And a great example is like that debate. If you had seen that debate, first of all, even then that debate felt like a dark comedy. But that debate didn't come out of nowhere. It came after 2016 already changed our conception of what was possible in debates. And I think that's the case for everything. And so I don't know that there is some like moment where we know it, it it's, it's collapsed. It's just collapsing. So I, I guess to be honest with you, if I gave you my real answer, and I hate, I really try not to do this because I feel like it's so easy to do it because it gets clicks and views. I genuinely feel like we are collapsing. That's how I feel. I feel like America is collapsing. And I don't really see any way, just like the financial crisis in 2008, the idea was those people that were trying to actually use monetary policy to positive effect, saw it as a way to create an orderly unwinding of global balance sheets, an orderly bankruptcy, if you will. But that's not actually what happened. So I think the best we can hope for is an orderly unwinding. But my concern is that this comes back to the geopolitical stuff. I mean, that's my biggest concern. I, I think that what we're in an environment today that feels a lot like both the interwar period and pre-1914. Because the interwar period, you had all of these economies in, in recession or depression, and you had rearmament in Germany, but you didn't have this idea that war was not going to happen again or it wasn't possible. You just went through one. Prior to World War I, the European economies were booming and the view at the time was that inter-economy dependence, the interdependence of economies was so great that no one would rationally go to war. Why would you risk all of that? And on top of that, you had the other thing with World War I, which was that you had a massive advancement in the technologies of war making. The Belgians were still building castles up until the breakout of World War I. Those things were completely decimated by German tanks. I mean, the, the Russians were sending cavalry out to the front lines. So like, that's where I'm, I'm concerned that that's where we are today. We, we haven't fought a war. The West hasn't fought a real war like the kind we're talking about since World War II. So even longer than with Europe and its skirmishes. We've got technologies that are more destructive than anything that we had back then in terms of the change of what there was and what what came with steel and industrialization. The battlefield has also expanded today. Back in the 1910s and 20s, the battlefield was still where the soldiers were. That's where the action was. Today, with cyber weapons, with political misinformation and active measures, the warfare is everything. The entire world is a battlefield. And so I'm very concerned because I see these combined risks and we've got a president who says crazy shit on Twitter. Even if you like Trump, if you're not, if you're not really in, in the camp of, an, of the nihilist that we've talked about, I don't see how you can, you can think that his tweets are safe or intelligent. They're completely reckless. You don't even conduct corporate policy. If you had a CEO like Donald Trump, the board would take his phone, except if you're Elon. Don't even get me into that conversation. But yeah, I mean, that's my take. Well, I didn't think we would, uh, we, we would get to this point, this uh, depressing uh, reality, potential reality. Well, you take a look at, I, you know, I'll, I'll say this. I just recorded an episode yesterday 
or two days ago with Ian Easton of the 2049 Institute. And it was a conversation initially meant to be on Taiwan. I mean, it was on Taiwan, but of course that drags in the US and China. And you know, the, one of the questions I asked him, and, and his answer sort of made me kind of appreciate this more deeply, which is I asked him, like, why is Taiwan so important to the CCP? Then I asked him a follow-up, which was why it seems that symbolism and symbolic victories are so important to the CCP. And what he said, and what I took away from his answer was essentially that because the Chinese Communist Party is is not a democratically elected government, it doesn't rule by popular mandate. And so the way in which it gains its legitimacy is through fulfilling goals, being able to point and say, see, we said we would do this in five years, we did it. See, we said we're going to raise living standards, we did it. And also, to the point about Taiwan, because they don't have a popular mandate, they don't want people in the mainland to look at Hong Kong and to look at Taiwan and take anything from that and say, well, maybe if the Taiwanese can live independently, maybe if the Hong Kongers can have their own system, then maybe we can have some more as well. And so they're fundamentally unsafe. And because they feel so fundamentally unsafe, they're constantly provoking. They're constantly looking to exploit and to expand. And the Russians also in their own particular way have this. And so I don't see how this is such a delicate issue. And that's what worries me. It's not just that we are falling apart. It's that we're dealing with two governments in the case of Russia's, Putin's Russia, in the case of the Chinese Communist Party's China that are, are fundamentally insecure and need to push outwards. And that's what concerns me. And they'll be there to pick up the pieces after the collapse, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the big risk here is that in, in, in absence of power that there, you know, these forces can come in and, and take over that void of power. But, you know, when that happens, at least we'll, we'll have like perfect security also in Europe and the US and we'll get cheap iPhones and, you know, all those things. There's that nihilism again. <laughs> it just keeps grouping up. Um, I, I want to yeah. come back just to this uh, before we, we get in a little bit more into crypto. I do want to come back to the Fed a little bit. And I heard your recent interview with Bill Nelson, which was great. And, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, this perception that the Fed is propping up markets. And something that he said in the interview, which was interesting, was that one of the Fed's mandates is to reduce unemployment. So in a context where unemployment is high because of forces that just simply the Fed doesn't have any power over, like a pandemic, for example, like the proliferation of artificial intelligence and things like that, what becomes the role of the Fed if it can no longer, or, or central banks just generally, I mean, this is more of a question about like the central banking model and its potential collapse. What is the role of a central bank if it can't do the very thing that it's meant to do, which is to you know, make sure that people have full employment and keep interest rates at a bearable level? So I think the Fed's interventions in markets are really a reaction to an imperfect situation, which is that fiscal policy has not mobilized in order to try and arrest the, the declines in asset prices and to try and equilibrate the gross inequilibria that have been generated from wealth inequality over the decades as a result of many of those forces as well. So I think this vision I had in my head is like this vision of like a, a paperclip factory trying to build a dam because the people with the wood aren't coming. And so like... I don't know. If, I'm sorry, Sebastian, if I didn't quite answer your question. I don't. Maybe you can rephrase it. Well, what is the role of a central bank moving forward when the conditions in which central banks were created for are totally different? You know, like the realities of the world in which central banks exist are totally different. Yeah. The, so the central bank is playing a role that it was never designed to play, and it cannot exactly. play we, that role well, and it's going to destroy itself in an effort to do it. I think their intentions are well-meaning. To a degree, but I don't think the Fed's, let's be very clear, the Fed is not there to serve the public. The Fed is there to serve the banking system, despite what anyone says. That's not why the Fed is there. To the extent that it serves the public, because it has some it has some popular mandate insofar as it's a political institution, but it's not there to serve the public. Do you think there's a role for crypto to play in this context? I mean, there's ideas around UBI's universal basic incomes that seniorage-based 
So basically the, the money that currently is created for the banks or that the banks can create because they're allowed to print money and lend it would go directly to the people and so on. Or do you see a way that crypto can or will fit into this? You know, I don't I don't know. I'd have to really think about that. I, I don't know that that's really the issue. Actually, I, I find the the focus in crypto on finance and money to be just a, an extension of this broader phenomenon of financialization and our the growth of our Ponzi economy. I think Bitcoin's ambitions were were sound, you know, no pun intended, but we've strayed very far from that. And I I think that a lot of the stuff that drew me into crypto in 2017 when we talked about the developer community and Ethereum, that also would have been promising and interesting and projects like that I think could add to real economic value. But the stuff like DeFi, I mean, right now everything in DeFi that I see it's an exploitation of the non-regulated landscape of DeFi. I think DeFi's greatest competitive advantage is that it's not regulated. So you can create a platform like Synthetics, which is basically a derivatives platform options market, and not have it regulated by the CFTC and the SEC. And I think that what I'm seeing today in DeFi are basically tools of speculation. So it's actually kind of disappointing. And I think what would be encouraging about crypto, to answer your question, like, is there a role for crypto? I think to the extent that you could have sound money and reliable currency, I, the problem, of course, with Bitcoin has been the issue of scale and actually having a payment system that can work, that can be secure, and that can actually process transactions at a scale that is that could lead a lot of merchants and vendors to use the platform. And then otherwise, it would be wonderful to see a lot of the kind of the stuff that was promoted in 2017, a lot of these, these dApps to begin to actually solve real world problems. Because again, I think the emphasis should be on the real economy and our political institutions, not on financial markets and not on money. I don't think the problem is, I mean, if, if you created some alternative money right now and central banks have fucked up the economy so much and governments have messed it up so much that we have bigger problems to solve. I'm not one of those people that believes that you can have, that Bitcoin can be successful without some level of buy-in by the government at the kind of scale that would be like transformational for society. Though I do think that its presence, its existence, just like gold, can have a powerful impact. But I don't think Bitcoin has that role today. I think gold does, but not Bitcoin. Can you give us an example of some of the dApps that were advertised in 2017 that you think would contribute value to society? Yeah. I mean, you know, off the top of my head, it's hard to, to remember a lot of them now. But like we talked about Hedera Hashgraph, or we talked about Ethereum, if you, for example, I mean, like I think like identity, you know, applications dealing with identity and helping people gain control of their data, um, being able to determine if a file has been altered. You know, like one of the things that I've talked about on Hidden Forces is the incredible vulnerability of hospital systems in the US. Like some insane number don't even have a firewall or, or a single dedicated IT person, and yet they have so many of their machines plugged into the internet. And you could just scramble blood records at random hospitals in the US on the day of surgery, people start dying on the table and you don't know what's causing it. And so the ability to know if a, if a blood record, for example, has been altered could have a meaningful impact on people's quality of life. I mean, stuff like that, stuff that's actually meaningful. But it's been a while since I looked at a lot of that stuff and I'd have to reevaluate my expectations based on what I know today, if I look at them now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think maybe this is me as, as the eternal optimist speaking. Um, to me, the ecosystem currently also has a very casino-like feel. Um, and I, I, I don't, I'm not loving it. Um, I don't think it's where, um, I, I don't, I don't think it's 100% true to the original ethos, but I do think it is complementary in that the experimentation that is currently going on with real money stakes kind of gives us a data treasure trove, you know, for how people behave depending on where incentives are and how liquidity moves and so on. So basically, I have kind of filed this under experimentation. And uh, basically, I, I think good things are going to come out of it. I think it's kind of 
you know, with this level of exuberance that basically whatever button you, you hit with sushi or pickle or sauerkraut or whatever is the latest craze, you make money. But I think that the data and the behavioral economics data that will come out of it will prove super valuable to the space. Yeah, I mean, you raised a, an interesting point early on about incentives. And, you know, since you're being the optimist, I'll be a bit of a pessimist or a cynic on this one, which is that, and this kind of ties into this libertarian anarchic ethos of Bitcoin, which I think is actually misplaced. You know, like certainly governments, and this is even more true of governments around the world, are to some degree or another corrupt wasteful, et cetera. But we actually have a really great track record in the United States of government having played a very constructive role for innovation and economic growth. I mean, from World War II through the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the United States with different arms of DOD was instrumental along with universities in the US to fund all the different components that gave us the digital revolution, from silicon chips to software to the internet, from which the private sector continues to derive value to this very day. And I think that what we're seeing in crypto is a community of open source protocols that are attempting to fund their internal development by relying on financial markets as opposed to having an efficient pipeline of capital where they can work in solitude. And when I say solitude, I mean without the shitcoin pumpers and dumpers coming in and out and feeling like they're owed something from the price of a token whose real primary function in a healthy economy is to fund innovation and to fund development of underlying technologies that can actually meaningfully impact and grow the economy. And so I think the irony is that the philosophy that animates crypto, besides being, I think, fundamentally incorrect, is also very much a, it reflects the failures of government to actually play a constructive role. And so in terms of incentives, I think it's not actually very beneficial for the most part that all of these applications are funded by tokens that trade on exchanges. And that people look at as ways to get rich quickly. You know, like, I don't know if you guys saw that, that Ample Coin thing that came out a few months ago, but I did some digging into that. Before that thing started to go south, I don't know where it is now, I actually came to a very clear determination that this was pure bullshit. And I know that as a fact, um, and I won't go into all the reasons that I know it, but even when I looked at the white paper, I was like, this is, and I don't necessarily think that the creators were trying to scam anyone. I think that perhaps they were, they saw it as a convenient way to get rich. And I think they were conveniently ignorant about what they were suggesting from the white paper. And I don't I remember now exactly, but I did a deep dive into it. And I totally saw that this does not make sense. It does not work. It completely misses entirely how markets work and how prices are formed. And that's just one example of something that's created to supposedly to solve a real world problem, but it's actually, it's just a way to get rich quick. The point is that that culture is so powerful that it infiltrates projects that are actually trying to do real work. And it, again, it's part of this whole like race to the bottom. It's just like the world on fire type of mentality. I was going to say, it kind of circles back to this kind of world on fire mentality and like, yeah, I don't have very formed opinions about Ampleforth to be honest, but uh... we had them on Oh, you did? Really? Yeah, we had them on. But even after listening to it, I still had, didn't really have formed opinions about it. Yeah. So basically, Sunny and I had him on, the CEO. Evan, we had Evan on. And we gave him a hard time because we also thought it didn't work. The entire rebase mechanism and basically kind of it's just a way of dividing up. I mean, basically, if proportionally everything stays the same, it doesn't matter what the denominative value of something is. Anyway, so we gave him a hard time. What to me was stood out about that project is the backers that it had. Because, I mean, there are tons of scammy projects in this space, ones that just don't work and ones that malicious. But that one had really good backers. So basically, they had a lot of Stanford people 
on the team, they are backed by Pantera and FBG and, you know, True Ventures and, I mean, the great funds in the space. And somehow they signed up for this. And to me, it's not clear whether it's malicious or whether they just didn't give it enough thought. But it was so, the white paper was so stupid. They had terms like macroeconomic friendliness, volatility, fingerprint. I mean, it was so obviously scammy that I just don't think that they couldn't know on some level. And also the way that they talked about how they were going to adjust, how the protocol counter cyclical pressure. I'm actually looking now, I wrote out this piece. I was going to publish it and I decided not to because honestly, I didn't want to like, I don't know, I just didn't want to. But it was like the step function like market cap curve that alters between dynamic states and equilibrium states. It was so full of misunderstandings, misinformation, bullshit, techno babble terminology. And like you said, and it had these sponsors who were, this just goes to show you. I mean, look, Nikola, have you guys been following the Nikola story? I mean, GM has like, a, what is it, like a $2 billion investment and Nikola's the, the other sort of electric or hydrogen car battery manufacturer that's trying to compete with Tesla. And their CEO has had to resign. It turns out it's everything is a giant scam. He bought the entire design from, from some guy in like Croatia or Serbia. Like the, it's insane. The level of scam is insane. Just like Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes, you had Tim Draper was an investor. And you had like, who was it? George Schultz or is George Schultz passed away? Somebody, some former defense secretary, secretary of state was invested in the project. It's crazy, but it makes sense when you think about the larger macroeconomic financial picture, which is that economics fundamentals don't matter. What matters is the story, the narrative, and the Fed. So of course you're going to get people that can't look at a balance sheet or can't read a, a white paper and say, what macroeconomic friendliness? What the hell is that? You know, and just say, I'm not going to get out of my office. Who let this person in? Fire my secretary. That's what a normal reaction would have been in 1970, but not today. Because, you know, it's just like the due diligence on Wall Street in 2007, you know, same thing. I want to ask you about cryptocurrencies as a reserve currency. And so we've we've talked about this on the podcast before. And actually, so we had Jim Bianco on a couple of months ago. He's a hedge fund manager and or sorry, he's the head of a research institute on financial markets. And his vision is that the cryptocurrency that could become the world reserve currency doesn't exist yet. You know, it's not Bitcoin, it's not Ether, it's probably not Libra. It's probably something that will come at some point in the future. Do you do you share this view that a cryptocurrency, a non-state governed currency, could become a world reserve currency? And how different would that be from anything we've ever known in terms of like a monetary ecosystem? That's a really tough question to answer directly. So I'll start, to, I'll start to answer it obliquely. I think that, yeah, I suppose it's possible. I mean, in a sense, gold was for a long time international money throughout the, the, the 19th century and, and into the early 20th. However, I don't know that it can be completely independent money. Again, I, I really question that narrative because governments are very powerful. And uh, I did an episode actually on this where my guest and I talked about his arguments for hyper-Bitcoinization, and I just felt that, I think that those arguments that are made by Bitcoiners, they're kind of like, they're very ideological and they don't fundamentally adhere to reality. So I think, I think that the right currency, sort of a scalable, secure, highly performative money could actually be very successful in the world, but I don't think that it would come without some level of government regulation. That would be my bet. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, regulation is one aspect, but like proper control, I think is like a totally different component. Well, maybe in other words, when I, okay, so let me rephrase that. The question is when the United States was on the sort of quasi gold standard of Bretton Woods, was it on that standard only because it provided some kind of constraint or was it also because we needed to have dollar bills. We needed to have a currency that could circulate and you can't have pieces of gold circulating. And so if you don't have the, the pretext of needing to have some kind of currency that can circulate, would there be a sufficient cause to create an intermediary currency as a government to sit between Bitcoin, between the sound money 
in this case if we're using Bitcoin, and the final user? Or would would you just basically end up having the equivalent of like the classical gold standard and everyone actually transacted in gold because you didn't actually have to have an, an intermediary currency? I don't know. All I would just say is that I find it very difficult to imagine that governments who are the most powerful entities in the world, not a protocol, they have the capacity to exert force on people. I just find it difficult to imagine that they wouldn't find some way to get their cut. I just think this is a constant force. Well, you know? maybe last question as we wrap up here, and I know this episode has been for some perhaps slightly depressing, but <laughs> what is your, your sort of uh, you know, positive outlook on the future, you know, maybe post 2020, what's like a positive scenario well, in do your you view? Have do, do you have one? Do you have a positive outlook? If you have one. Yeah, yeah. So before, and in case I forget that, let me just say one more thing, because I forgot to say this, because it was my most profound realization when I studied Ampleforth, because it came on my radar because someone I know who I really, I really like, uh, he's a kind of a 26-year-old millennial or Zoomer, and I I, uh, I rely on him to get kind of that particular perspective. He put this on my radar because he was making a shit ton of money. And actually, this kid texted me a couple of days ago, and he was pumping some other coin. <laughs> I, I, I want to find it. But anyway, he was making a ton of money, and all of a sudden, he like, it, like a bunch of it got like stolen or it got scammed or something. I don't know. Anyway, so he's always kind of experimenting with these pumps and dumps. And he was making a ton of money with Ampleworth. And so I did this analysis. And then I, I decided after I was done, but I actually don't know if it really matters. Because the argument here has nothing to do with fundamentals. Like, forget this thing doesn't need to work. People don't care. When you go and you look at the Discord channels or like the subreddits, people just, they're all engaged in a pump and dump. They all know it. That's what Wall Street Bets is. They're not interested in the cash flow of the company. That's why they bid stuff. Hertz's his stock valuation up a thousand percent after it went bankrupt. So I just want to just say that because that's the, I think the most profound realization after looking at Ampleworth. Not Ampleforth. None of this, none of this really matters. The white papers don't matter. What matters is like what do you think's going on with the momentum and the memes? Because that's all that matters. That's how you can make money. If you're an expert at that, you can make money in crypto today. But don't try that, kids. This is not financial advice. Just to be clear. And your question was, do I am I optimistic about stuff? I think there are many places that I've been and likely continue to be optimistic. I think I sound so pessimistic in part because I'm I'm doing all these episodes recently on geopolitics. And also I'm pretty tired, so that probably I've had a lot of work on my plate the, the last few weeks and months with a new project I've taken on. So like that could probably you know, impact my disposition. But like one area where I've been optimistic, very optimistic actually, has been with you know, what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. And I've been optimistic for a while about free societies pushing back against the sort of techno-utopian, techno-babble, futurist, you know, what's that expression? Ride or die crew, like the the sort of want to live forever, Silicon Valley, rich, libertarian, liberal, whatever, like the sort of ruling class. Because I think that people really are awake and aware to just how destructive social media has been. And so like, I'm optimistic about solutions there. I think whether it's stuff that we covered in my episode with Cal Newport um, on digital minim minimalism of people actually trying to hack these platforms or hack the cameras or whatever to just large scale interventions. I think this is one of those bipartisan issues that both Republicans and Democrats agree on. And eventually I do think that these companies will be regulated to the extent that they're regulated effectively remains to be seen. I think that ultimately will have to do with that really comes down to leadership. You know, I, I like public education can only go so far. I think we haven't seen the kind of education in Congress and the Senate that you'd need to see for these people to be able to draft meaningfully intelligent regulations. But I think, in my view, I think these companies should and hopefully will be regulated like utilities. And I don't think that these companies should be able to operate on an ad model. This is something I talked about with Sinan Aral. And I said to him, you know, do you think that we should ban the ad model? And he's like, I don't think you should ban any business model. But in this particular case, I don't think that Google or Facebook should be running an ad model. I don't think they should be getting paid for clicks. I think that just that doesn't work and they should just be banned from doing it. So I think 
that's one area where I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic on Europe. Like I said, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. I'm somewhat pessimistic as a Greek citizen about the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, although maybe a little bit more optimistic based on just how seemingly incompetent and reckless Erdogan is, and maybe he'll get sucked in. Like I said in my episode with Peter Zeihan, the best hope for Greece is that Turkey will get sucked into some confrontation either with Iran or up across the Bosphorus or down into Syria and really will stop being so aggressive in the Mediterranean because it would be very concerning if Turkey begins to occupy islands in force uh, in the East Med. So Europe, I'm, I'm optimistic about because of the external security factors that could help them become stronger and more cohesive. So that's another area. So there you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you found something. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, guys, it was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, we definitely talked about more things than I expected. Yeah, it was great. Thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah, cool. It was my pleasure. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.